The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. Uh, Christmas lights like I did? No, I had uh, my whole stream up. I had to climb the ladder, get on the house, get the whole stream across, and then I plugged it in, and I had that moment, just like him. And I used the same swear words he used in the movie. It was just <laughs> identical. And, and I forgot to test them, and doggone, it was a defective stream of lights. So I... I uh, I didn't take last year's Christmas lights down, so I had to take them down because they didn't work, and then I put up another one that didn't work, so I was up there three times, and I was, it was not pretty, but now the house looks great, and everyone's <laughs> happy. So we're uh, in the middle of a series called Christmas at the Movies, and uh, we're looking at some of the things that we love about the movies that we, we watch over and over again this time of year, and know all the lines, uh, the laughs, the cries, and there's something about them that gives them that staying power, that we like to watch them. They, they reveal a side of life that we either want to laugh and cry about over and over again or just takes us back to a simpler time. Sometimes doing that helps us to see the gospel from a different perspective too, which we're going to look at today. Um, before we go into it though, just a reminder, our lighthouse map is to the right. This is an awesome opportunity if you want to just declare and ask God's help being a light in your neighborhood and attack where you live and then grab a lighthouse slip either from your bulletin or on the table there and go to the, our website and you can watch a video uh, explaining how it works, how to set the stage and shine a light in your neighborhood. Jesus said the most important thing you can do are two things, love God and love your neighbors. And so that's a big deal. You're not living where you live by accident at all. And uh, also on the, on the web page that the, the slip will take you to is a video of me actually doing a selfie prayer walk. Felt a little weird, but, you know, I uh, just wanted to show you how to do it. Yesterday I took my kids. Once I, if I, I pulled them out of the, the two-inch snow out of the front yard for a minute, and we just did a little prayer walk up and down our street and prayed for our neighbors and asked Jesus to be present and powerful in those homes and marriages and families and uh, so it's a really cool thing to do personally and also with loved ones to, to see your neighborhood through God's perspective. It's a very, very cool thing. So don't miss out on that. Check it out. And also on Wednesday, how many of you love the Christmas carol? Two of you. Awesome. How many of you hate Christmas caroling but would be willing to come anyway? That's the rest of you. Good. So uh, this Wednesday, we're going to meet at Edgewood Village. It brings some real hope and good news. So imagine many people at retirement homes don't have a pretty, they, they don't have a huge world. They, they have a, a room and then maybe a commons area. And to bring the world and the good news of hope to, to folks who uh, really appreciate it is, is a really cool thing for us who are mobile, who get to walk around freely and, and have our, our youth, so to speak. So uh, meet at 6.30 Edgewood, Edgewood Village, 6 o'clock for teens. They're going to meet at Luna Fusion. But everyone is going to meet back at Luna Fusion after we got all kinds of fun and treats and stuff like that. So uh, please join us on Wednesday if you'd like to. Let's have a word of prayer before we dive into today's message. I think it's a pretty important topic for all of us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father... Um, would you give us a perspective today that is totally the opposite of our human thinking and protect each one of us from the arrogance and the self-hatred that comes from seeing the world through human eyes instead of a God-breathed perspective. And as we see from your vantage point, it's beautiful, it's hopeful, it's encouraging, it's inspiring, it's clear. It lifts us out of the fog and the confusion to see the, the, the future that you are bringing about as you began your work in the manger. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, how many of you can be honest enough to say you've had a moment in your life where you said this isn't fair? How many of you are honest enough to say that happened this morning probably? As you're getting your kids ready to, for church. Yeah, two, two hands from one mom. Um, this is part of how humans deal with the world. We process reality that is not matching our expectations. And we're human beings with brains, so we have expectations and we have plans and we have desires. But scriptures are careful to say that my plans are not your plans, God says. And so there's this twofold reality that humans have thinking and humans have plans and so does God and they're usually not the same and part of being a, God, a person who follows God is being able to acknowledge that they're not the same and they're not co-equal that gods are better that gods are higher and that ours are usually skewed in the direction of problems and pain and that whether we understand God's perspective or not it's, it's better however it oftentimes doesn't feel fair now I got in the truck this morning, and my wife has told me over and over again, don't bring coffee in the truck without a cover. And of course, I didn't listen, and I spilled all over myself, and, and I'm blaming the universe for this, you know? I'm like, come on! And I'm like, what? 
This is my fault. My leg is hot because of me. I can't blame the universe. I did this. But I had this moment of life isn't fair. This wouldn't happen to a, a better person or a person that's not targeted by reality to, to do a cruel joke on. So we have these, but oftentimes they're very serious and painful. This isn't fair. It's like thinking back to a childhood in which there was abuse or addiction in your household. That is not fair. You didn't deserve it. No one does. And why some kids get to grow up in homes where they're taken to sky zone and pizza places and some are neglected at best. It is not fair. And that unfairness can ruin our lives even more than the events themselves. And God wants to heal us from that. Sometimes men in particular get to a point in their lives where they have that stereotypical midlife crisis where their expectations of life now collide with a reality that is way, way different than they have hoped. The movie Family Man, I think, spells this out really beautifully. Check this out. This isn't fair. He compared his version of reality with the version of reality he's living in, and it wasn't fair, and he had to deal with the dissonance, the difference, and humans respond to those differences in a couple different ways. Now, here, a Bible situation of this isn't fair. This isn't just something that God invented today. This is something that has always existed. People being treated differently. People seeming to experience the reality that, why did God give them that and, and me this? Why do I have this body and she or he has that? But why? Why is that family and me this family? Why? Why, why that job? This job? Why? So Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist. Zechariah was a priest, a pastor, so he kind of did what I do. Go to church, you, do, you serve God's people, all that stuff. You know, you maybe sometimes kind of feel entitled to maybe a little bit of an extra blessing from God because you, you're doing the Lord's work, which is crazy. We all do the Lord's work, but sometimes preachers can think that way. Okay, good. So, interestingly enough, God has the same announcement to give to Zechariah that he gives to Mary and Joseph. Your wife is going to have a baby, and that's biologically impossible. In Mary's case, it's because she's a virgin. In Joseph's case, it's be, or in, in Zechariah's case, it's because his wife is like a hundred, and you know they sleep in separate bedrooms, and they're not even planned on. This is just not going to happen for Joseph for for Zechariah. So the message is going to be equally surprising to them. So watch watch how this rolls out, and how God treats each of them very differently with their doubts. Zechariah asks the angel after he gets the news, how how. <laughs> Like, I took health class. I, I know how this works. How's this going to be? How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife Elizabeth is well along in years. He hopefully didn't say that to her. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. Don't talk to me about biology. I stand and I gaze into this majestic face. I'm still glowing from being in his presence. Give me a break. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell you the truth about this good news. And now, here's how God addresses his doubts. And now, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens because you didn't believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. So, to address his doubts, God makes Zechariah mute for nine or at least nine months. You don't know if this was before or right on the, the moment when she got pregnant. So it could have been 10 plus, could have been a year. What? I just asked how? I just, I'm an old guy, she's old. Like, God. I just don't think this is going to happen. I need you to tell me how this is going to happen. I need some proof. Here's your proof. Zip. His wife probably liked him a lot better for the next year. This might be a model of how to be a good husband during pregnancy. Zoop. Angel comes to Mary half a year later. Same message, same biological impossibility, same doubts. Watch this. How? How can this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? I mean... I also went to health class. It was last year. I'm a young lady, but yeah, I, I also know how this works. 
Watch God's different response. The angel answered, well, well what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit's going to come on you and the power of the whole, Most High will overshadow you. And So this isn't going to be biological, it's going to be spiritual. And, and so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When Elizabeth, that's, John, or that's, that's John's mom, Zachariah's wife, when Elizabeth, your relative, is, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Six months of bliss. Her husband hasn't been, able to, hasn't been able to talk the whole time. For no word from God will ever fail. So God gives Mary comfort, confirmation, check out what happened to Elizabeth, and companionship. You're going to go and hang out with Elizabeth, and she's going to encourage you to address her doubts. Can you imagine what happened when the word got back to Zechariah? And you're like, mm -hmm. that's not fair. She had doubts. I had doubts. She asked how. I asked how. I haven't been able to call my dog for six months. Now, that's not fair. From a human perspective, that is not fair. Maybe he should have known better. He's a pastor. He's older. He's seen more of life. And maybe God addressed it different. Or maybe he, it was bigger than Zechariah. And maybe his muteness encouraged Mary in a way that she needed to be encouraged by, by that confirmation that could only come in a certain way. But, but it wasn't fair from one perspective. You and I will deal with the unfairness of life in three different ways, either inwardly directing our anger or disappointment or outward. Here's, here's the three ways. If you're taking notes in your bulletin, there's a nice spot on the back page to, to track along with this. This is really, really important stuff. When I work with families, when Ernie and, and I work with families, or when we uh, talk to counselors, when we read uh, about family dynamics and mental health, this is really ultimately what it all comes down to in many cases. How we deal with this. First response humans have to life not feeling like it's fair is self-despair. We turn inward. We, 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 our anger about the reality that is not turns inward becomes anxiety. This is how I process disappointment. This is how I process the dissonance between what I think should be and what isn't. And basically, I and people who have this issue will direct that question upon themselves, say, I should be better. If I were better, this would be better. So I have to be better, and I have to figure this out, how I can be, and, or I, I don't think I can be better, and so something's wrong with me. Zechariah could have said, I guess I'm not a very good priest. I guess I'm not a very good guy. I'm not a very good husband. If I were better, this would be happening to me. So God's punishing me because I'm, I don't have enough faith. I should be better. Kids would like me if I were better. I'd be prettier if I were better. If I were just smarter. If I were just funnier. If I were just stronger. This is happening because something's wrong with me. I don't even know what it is. I just know something's wrong with me. I've always known it. It's always going to be this way. can push ourselves to the very edge of self-hate, self-despair. Because all of life and all of reality is somehow put through a perverted lens that makes me the problem of every problem I have. And there's an element of truth to it because we do bear responsibility for our lives, but the world isn't all about us. So even though it's self-hatred, it's still self absorption. It's still seeing myself instead of God at the center of my universe. That I'm the solution or the cause of my problem. And that enables people around us to sometimes be unhealthy because it's always my fault and I, I always have to, 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 to fix it and to, to try to please. And This is one response. This is the inward direct, directed response to a world that isn't fair. Second one is outwardly. So either you do it inward or outward. Secondly, you blame someone else. You take someone in your life because it's too hard or just unimaginable to turn in and do some of that reflection. You have to find someone else. You have to put a target on someone else's back and say, you did this to me. I've talked to couples who have moved a couple times throughout their marriages and one of the things that often happens is we took that job and we moved to that city and I didn't really want to. Even though I agreed to, I didn't want to. And and it was my spouse dragging me, and there's this lingering bitterness. We shouldn't be here, and it's because of you. You did this to me. I thought we decided together. No, no, it was you. This is your fault. This is your problem. You should have been better. 
This response, directing that dissonance outwardly, trying to deal with it by targeting someone to at least finish the confusing sentence of life with, and it happened because of him or her. Processing reality by blaming someone else, a reality we don't like that should have been better. The third response is a lot like the second. It's instead of turning to another person, it's turning to God and blaming God or rejecting God. I don't think God minds our doubts. I don't think he minds us saying, I, you know, God is involved here. But it's, it can be a sense of God is not doing the right thing and I know better than God. It's God should have been better. Granted, granted, I'm a little younger than him. Granted, he's the one that kind of laid out the universe and the blueprints for Jupiter and, and, and the Milky Way galaxy and the, the universe. But, I, you know, I really do have a better compass on how life should work, and it's this way and not that way. And look, if I would have designed the universe, I would have done it different than God. I would have made chocolate very good for you. Are you with me? Vegetables would be bad for you. Bullets would turn to bubbles when they were fired from guns. Okay, that's how I would have done it. Yeah? Do I know better than God? Do I? If I would have done it a certain way, the consequences I can't imagine would bear fruit. And God somehow designed the universe exactly as he wanted it to be designed, including the problems and tragedies we face. For me to look up and say, you should have been... A loving God wouldn't do this to me. A loving God wouldn't let hurricanes exist. A loving God would change my spouse. A loving God wouldn't let that loved one struggle with cancer. A loving God would X, Y, and Z. A loving God wouldn't X, Y, and Z. I'm angry. Understandable. And I'm taking God's place by telling him that I know he should have been better. The key word that united all... Did you see the same word in all three of these statements? It's should. Should is a dangerous, dangerous word. Should places demands on reality that is not the way I want it to be. And I tell you this, I see so many of us, myself included, who struggle because we place these should demands on reality. It kills us. You're going to ruin your Christmas, by the way, if you know how everybody should act, right? Doctors, when they, they tell people you know, to get ready for their birth, what do they say? Don't have any expectations. Just go with it. You know, a lot of first-time moms have these birth plans, and they want sparklers and wind chimes and, and, and music uh, at, at a certain volume and everything to go a certain way, and the doctor's like, uh, this is not going to go well, okay? Just be ready. Don't have too many shoulds, right? Because when you should, you start to reject the past that's already happened. This shouldn't have happened. You shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. God shouldn't have done that. And now I'm placing myself at odds with actual history that, can I change it? it the problem is it did happen. He did abuse you. You did get fired. You did go bankrupt. You did get injured. It, it did happen. So to say that it shouldn't have doesn't do any good. It did. It protests a past you can't change, or it rejects a present that is, or it demands control of the future. You shouldn't do that in the future. If you do, I'm gonna, don't you dare. Now I am demanding control of you in the future. Shoulds place me at odds with reality, which creates anxiety within myself. That's that first response where I'm despairing of myself. I have reality. I have my should of what it should be. And that means I am departing from reality. And I'm over here and it's uncomfortable in a different place than, than reality. And so that creates anxiety if I direct it in myself or anger if I direct it towards other people or God. We have to respond when we do this. This fracturing maladjustment requires us to adjust somehow. And our human response is Goods, which creates anxiety or anger or both. And it's all about trying to be God. It's about, I know better than God about how it should be, and that puts me in his place. Funny thing is, when you go to scripture, you see a very different perspective on reality that, that looks totally differently. And, for example, look at Romans 8 here. Romans 8 says this, and we know that in all things God works for the good. It doesn't say he works only good things to happen. It doesn't say that we get back rubs every morning and dessert for lunch and no pain 
no brokenness. It doesn't say that he makes only good things happen. It says that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That means through good and bad. That means what we think should happen and what we think shouldn't happen, who have been called according to his purpose. In other words, if you have things that are happening that you don't want, what if it was actually a sign that he has bigger plans for you than you do and that you don't get to understand them all and that you get to, to come to him and say, thank you that I don't have to understand how the universe completely works, but I get to trust that you do and that this is somehow going to work out. So in the darkest of times, I have a better answer. In the most difficult problems that I can't solve, I don't have to just unravel, and deteriorate with anxiety or anger because I wasn't created to control and understand it. That's not my place in the reality and universe. I get to step back and say, I am instead of shoulding, I am going to trust in a God who works through all things for the good of those who love him. Now, Joseph, a character in the book of Genesis, mastered this art. This was, I think Joseph was born just different. There are those people that, like I told my grandpa when he was alive, I said, Grandpa, I don't think you've ever sinned. I've never seen you sin. And of course, he disagreed with me because he's a good Christian man and he knew different, but he's like, you seem different than the rest of us. And all of his kids grandkids kind of thought he was an angel, like we're still not sure if he's a real person or not. And there are those people that just kind of grow up differently, and his brothers hated him for it. He was like his parents' favorite kid. They tried to kill him, literally, and then they, but they decided to be merciful and instead to sell him into slavery. My brother did that a couple times to me. We're over it now. We're good now. But they sold him into slavery, and in slavery, he's falsely accused of sexual um, assault, and so he's put in jail, and in jail, he's forgotten in jail, for years before they actually think of him and let him out. And then when he gets out, he didn't come out of jail with all kinds of anger and resentment and shoulds. He came out of jail because he was always ready to serve God in jail. And they remember that he could interpret dreams. So he came to the Pharaoh, interpreted the Pharaoh's dream, the king's dreams, and told him, you better prepare for a famine. And he said, well, you're the guy that's going to help me if you're that insightful. So they put him in second in charge in all the land from prison to palace. And he orchestrates an administration that stores grain for seven years and then provides people who are hungry with grain for the next seven years of drought. Then his brothers and his dad come from their drought-stricken land to Egypt to get grain because everybody in the world hears that there's grain in Egypt. And then they have this amazing moment of surprise discovery that this is Joseph, and then Joseph realizes that this is my brothers, and it's like, what's going to happen? His brothers are terrified. Joseph's response to their fear reveals where his heart has been at. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Look at the yellow. The yellow reveals that he did not look at this world through the lens of should, which puts you in God's seat. Knows better than God. Knows whose fault everything is. Am I in the place of God? The assumed answer to his question is absolutely not. Elsewhere he says, I don't need to forgive you. You sinned against God. Whatever you did was between you and God. You did it to me, but at the end of the day, I'm not God. He needs to forgive you if you need forgiveness. Beyond that, he understands this dual agency where you might have done something for one reason, but God had his own reasons. He said, you intended to harm me on the human level. All you could see was your anger and your shoulds of he should be different. We don't like him. We should be better. We should be the favorite son. We're going to get rid of him. We're going to kill him. We're going to sell him. That's all you saw. It was your intended harm, but God, on a whole nother level, intended it for good. God works for good for all who he loves and he calls according to his purposes. He knew Romans 8 before it was written. The saving of many lives. So then he repeats, bookending what he's saying, do not be afraid. You did this out of your human brokenness, the should that you placed upon reality. It led you to do tragic things, and it does. That's why people strap bombs on themselves and do terrible things, is they demand a different world, and they're willing to do anything to get it. That's why people harm themselves, because their anger directs inward as anxiety, and they can't stand life. They despair of living. Joseph said, this is God's deal. I'm just playing my part. I don't get to tell him how it's supposed to be. He knows how it's supposed to be. He knows how it should be. This happened for their reasons, but it also happened for his reasons. He needs to forgive if there's forgiveness to be given. And he allowed.
allowed this to happen, now I see for the saving of thousands and thousands of lives. It got me here to the place where I'm at. And some of the things that happen to you and have happened to you, you're not going to understand what God is doing through it. Maybe even until you're old. Maybe even after your lifetime, when you get to heaven, you're going to finally say, oh, thank you for showing me what you did through that. Here's what this means. And this is going to sound a little bit crass, but it's great for the memory. You and I need to stop shooting on ourselves. No, I will not apologize. Don't email me. That's why we kick the kids out. We have to stop shooting on ourselves. It only hurts us, and it hurts the people around us too. And this is, by the way, copyright Ernie. This is Ernie's phrase, I think. I think I heard this from Ernie. He's a, he's a master of this stuff. He teaches this stuff all the time. You have to stop shooting your way through life. Instead of looking at yourself and say, I should look different. I should be this. I should have done that. I'm struggling with this because I did that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the person I could be because I did. Or looking at others and say, you did this to me. This is your fault. I'm bitter at you. I'm angry at you. I'm angry at you, God. You shouldn't have done this. A loving God wouldn't allow, instead of shooting your way through life, take the perspective of faith. That's what faith is. It's not just, gee, I think Jesus died for me. It's, I'm willing to accept and embrace a God I don't understand, a future I can't predict, and problems I don't like. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection means God wins. <coughs> As Van comes back up, my challenge to you today is just to move from demands to decisions. Here's how you do that. You, instead of saying, you know what, this world should work different, <coughs> you can acknowledge how you feel about it. You can say, man, I don't like that. Man, I wish he hadn't hit me. But it happened. I can't change that it happened. I'm not going to place myself at odds with a reality that is. I'm going to make decisions about what I do now. I'm going to separate myself from that person now. I'm going to deal with my, the conflict in this way. I didn't start it, but I'm going to handle it. I'm going to control the one thing that I can control, and that's my response to reality. Instead of blaming and shooting my way through life, I am going to make decisions based upon <clears throat> not my version of reality that I think should be here, but based upon God's promise to work all things for good. It means he can do things through what you're going through right now. It doesn't mean you have to understand it. It just means that you have to pretend that you understand it by just trusting the God who does understand it and operate in obedient faith and treat people with love and with truth and with courage. That means you do need to confront some things and not just despair against yourself, but also say, this is hurting. I can't let that happen. I have to create boundaries because I'm making decisions about how to manage the reality God's given me faithfully. Move from making demands of reality to decisions about reality. Flush the shoulds. I tell you, it helps you remember, I promise. You'll, when you're on the pot today, what are you going to think about? You know you are. You know, you, and when you hit that flush, what are you going to think about? The shoulds are coming down with you. Send them down. Because they only, they only stink up your life. See what I did there? They only rot their way to the core of who you are and break your relationship. They clog up the pipes, another one, of your joy. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not apologizing, okay? Shooting your way through life, I promise you, will make you miserable. It will alienate you between yourself and God and yourself and others. It will make you feel like this world is not a fair place or it's a cruel place because something is really, really wrong and God is too weak to deal with it. But that's not the God that I see. I mean, he came as a weak baby. He looked kind of weak on the cross. They did butcher him and it didn't seem very powerful in the moment. You know what he said on the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing.
they mean it for evil, you're going to mean it for good. You're going to work through my crucifixion for the good of all whom you call according to your purpose. You're going to change neighborhoods forever. You're going to change families. There are going to be billions and billions of people. Even though hundreds now are laughing and mocking and they think this is the end, they don't see your purpose and your dream. This is going to be very, very good. And so he breathed his last after saying the words, it is finished. You stand and pray. Father, as we leave today, we pray for the power to flush our shoulds right out of our life, to not take the disintegration of the world and blame ourselves. Taking responsibility is a good thing, but self-despair is a sin. Self-absorption is a sin. We are not at the center of the universe. It will not cater to our needs, demands, and feelings. And it's also a sin to reject and hate and resent other people for the problems we face, even if they did it to us. Forgive us for self-hatred or other hatred. Forgive us for rejecting you and telling you that we know better. And instead, teach us how to live in faith in a God whose ways are always higher than our ways and whose plans are always, always better than expected. Jesus said, this is eternal life. Not having everything going my way, but knowing you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And God, if there's a person in this room who doesn't know you, who came to church today and said, I just, I'm just here, but I don't really know God, give them the courage to come forward and pray after church today. They need to know you to be able to live with this kind of irrefutable joy. In Jesus' name.